This episode is brought to you by Summer School Electronics. With pedals like the Snow Day Delay, the Pep Rally Fuzz, the Trash Panda, and my personal favorite, the Science Fair, which is two classic dirt pedals in one with a mid-boosted overdrive on one side, a black lab rat circuit on the other, and a blend knob to blend between them to find the perfect classic stacked dirt sound you're looking for, it's hard not to find something you'll love. Mark builds all of his pedals by hand in Syracuse, New York, where he also works as a full-time educator. In addition to the super fun graphics on their pedals, Mark also offers custom artwork. Want your dog's face on a pedal? He can do it. Want your face on a pedal? He can make that happen too. Go over to summerschoolelectronics.com and make sure to tell them that 40 Watt Podcast sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 40 Watt Podcast. Uh, thank you for joining me this week. I'm super excited about this episode. Uh, you've already listened to all the advertising spiels at the top of the episode, though I put that there. I don't have to tell you all that now. So instead, I'm going to introduce you to our guest. And as per my normal, I am not going to try to pronounce someone's last name because I know better. Um, but I'm going to welcome Barry from Grez Guitars. Barry, how you doing? All right. Awesome. I appreciate you having me. And uh, yeah, I pretty much just go by Barry from Grez Guitars. It's just easier. <laughs> it, it is. It's a there are there are a few consonants there in your name that I'm not used to pronouncing together like that. So. Yeah. 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 No. So um, I reached out to you because uh, I've been. Uh, I, we were just talking about gear acquisition syndrome, and we'll circle back around to that here in a minute. But uh, one of those that has been staring me in the face is uh one of your uh mendocinos because i've been i've been i've been looking not looking for a baritone you oh, know how that is and um I do. well i yeah, appreciate looking, the consideration <laughs> yeah looking but not looking but yeah i keep staring back at those and of course blake over at the tone mob won't shut up it's like ah, you don't have to yes. blake you don't have to sell me more seriously but uh so really happy to have you on the episode so we're gonna do um, I'm sure by now you've been on the Tone Mob. I haven't gone back through Blake's very <laughs> vast array of back episodes to see everybody that's been on there. Yeah, um, once a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. So but, let's do what Blake does, and I'm going to what we call the 30,000 foot view. Uh, how'd you get into guitars? How'd that translate into guitar making? And uh, how'd you get to where you are? Yeah. Um, trying to think how to summarize uh, 52 years of stuff. Um, so, uh, tinkerer fix guy who could fix things, took things apart as a kid, fixed my own motorcycles and bicycles. So always been a more of a mechanically minded person. Okay. Uh, got into electronics late in high school. So I really started out and guitar, uh, but, uh, never seriously with guitar, right? Just, uh, terrible guitar player just the way it goes <laughs> doesn't mean i don't enjoy it right obviously here right, we are right but um there's there's no uh there's no skill requirement on enjoying anything in life y'all yep. remember that yeah i feel like i'm a reasonably self-aware person and it was very obvious to me even in high school that i would never earn any money playing guitar so oh yeah i might enjoy it but that's fine that was as far as it was gonna go so but electronics piqued my interest seriously because it, um it started to explain things, right? We just, you know, record players and stereos and guitar amps and pedals and, and just what's inside of guitar. What are these knobs and what do they do? And that quick little introduction to electronics course I took just sort of light bulbs started going off. Like, wow, that's what that is. That's how this works. <laughs> this is amazing. So I started out in, as a, eventually becoming an electronics designer. And I, I made a living for, for a long time designing audio <laughs> products uh, equalizers, signal processors, eventually loudspeakers, um, kind of had a whole separate career in the audio industry outside of guitars. Yeah. And, um, which is a whole other world. It's, it's a um, different actually, thing. And my, actually, my corner I'm, of it, I'm, I want to, I want to caveat here and give an idea just cause, and we're going to try to remember where we are. 
Uh, so I went to school for music and audio engineering. Uh, it's not a double major. It was an interdisciplinary degree. I did most of my classes in music. Uh, like okay. I, I liked audio engineering. I was actually working as an audio engineer before I went back to college. Um, really, it was just a route to get me out of college because my degree program didn't have a path for guitar. So it was a way for me to get a music degree without a real path for a BA in music. So neither right. here nor there, never explained that before. I'm sure someone will ask me about it. But my instructor in audio, in audio engineering, he worked front of house for Aretha Franklin for years. And he got into the music industry. He was a keys player organist. And, but he got in as an electrical engineer. And let me tell you, there were times because I was working as an audio engineer before I came to the program. So he'd start talking about things in class and look at me like I'm supposed to know what he's talking about. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you know, like an 1176 and a 1073 and an API and a Neve and like he starts throwing out things at the time that I knew nothing of. And I'm like, Mike, I run sound in a blues club. <laughs> on a 35 year old PV mixer. It doesn't even have <laughs> faders, it has knobs. <laughs> right. Exactly. The first one did. It just had knobs. It was like, yeah. So, yeah. And so when you say you came at it from an electronics background, that's, that feels like a just before my age and generation, that seemed to be a common path into music gear. Like I see it yeah. more and more. In those, I think you're just a touch older than me, and it's like in that age, um, uh, it, it seemed very common to approach it from like an electronics engineering or, a, hey, I used to rebuild radios, and so I started playing guitar through one, and then I decided to make amps. You yeah. know, it's well, like you, you know the interesting thing that probably people of my age had the opportunity to do, which is slightly different than you, even though you know you're not that much younger. Mm -mm. Um, when I came into the industry, um. Let's say that the industry changed in the 60s and 70s. You know, you have the Grateful Dead wall of sound. The kinds of loudspeakers that were being used for big PAs were changing, right? It was no longer just like, uh, you know, uh, column speakers. They were becoming what looks right. a little bit more like modern sound systems. <laughs> so the people who were on the forefront of designing all that stuff, you know, the dead wall of sound, all of those sort of innovations – when I came in, they were still in the middle to the late part of their careers. Gotcha. So I worked with all those people. They were my bosses and my mentors. So I got to learn from guys who, you know, were there when, you know, uh, the Beatles played Candlestick. They were doing sound. And, you know, uh. they, they, you know, fixing Jimi Hendrix's guitar amps just because, you know, they were the local sound company when he was coming through town. And, and he would blow up amps a lot, apparently. And so, <laughs> so, so Surprising just, no one. Right, right. So there was this, this this group of really sort of brilliant folks uh, it, that came out of the San Francisco Bay Area, really, um, that I was fortunate enough to work for, kind of apprentice under. It was, you know, it was a job. They were my bosses, but it was really an apprenticeship yeah. program to get to hang out with these folks. Um, and they're all retired and kind of gone now. Yeah. You know, but it was sort of an interesting moment in time where um, – people from all walks of life were coming into the audio industry to create cool stuff. Uh, Cause in the seventies you didn't go to school to learn how to design an audio compressor, right. Right. Or a giant stadium sound system. These were all people who these topics were their hobbies that they ended up taking very seriously. Like, the, like at one point, my, uh, one of the guys I worked for was a, nuclear physicist he worked on the propulsion system for the enterprise but what? his passion was audio and he was he was designing these crazy cutting edge audio pieces <laughs> of equipment and this was the guy that i sat next to and worked with right oh that's awesome so there's people from all these different places and all of these different backgrounds but all with a common love of audio and that's i don't know that was just like a weird moment in time where audio was changing and yeah. Uh, yeah, I was lucky enough to to be on the coattails of that and hang out with these yeah. people. That's so cool, and it's such a great it's such a great angle to come at it from. That I, I sort of wish was a little more common. You know, d doing this podcast and talking to builders, and I, I talked to a lot of the pedal guys who are like, "Oh, well, you know, I bought a kit, and the kit taught me how to build a pedal, and from there I started tinkering with pedals. Then I learned a little right. more. Then I learned. Then you get someone like Mike Trombley from Native Audio, who's like, "No, I'm an electronic engineer." <laughs> and like that's right. that's how he got into it, you know. Um, 
it's 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 such an interesting way to see the the angles at which people come into the music industry. Um, and I always, I always feel a little intimidated when someone comes in and says, it, it's like I'm back in class with Mike and he's like, I'm an electronics engineer. And it's like, I'm like, Oh no, I'm not going to, I'm going to feel like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, there's so, so I, much to know and so many topics and so much to forget. I haven't really done a lot of audio circuit design in a long time. That's just sort mm-hmm. of something from my past. And every once in a sure. while I need to, and it's, it's weird how much I've forgotten. Like I'll sit down to do something and like, uh, I don't remember the formula to calculate this thing that I used to do every day, you know, Oh yeah, uh, shoot. But so, so that, but that leads, you know, one thing leads to the next. Uh, so, you know, electronics design, speaker design, eventually just being an acoustical consultant and, um, and I sort of missed product design though, something I really enjoyed. So I was working oh. as a, an acoustical consultant for a long time, you know, just designing the insides of, 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 you know, places of worship, basketball arenas, school auditoriums, whatever, recording studios. And that's all fine and fun, but I wasn't really designing products for a while. And I kind of missed it and somehow ended up realizing that with a background in acoustics and audio and product design and, you know, industrial design is just part of being a good product designer. Um, I could probably design and build a guitar. Yeah. So I, and, and I was always a hobbyist woodworker, you know, I had a table saw and a router and would make, you know, an end table or whatever. So I had some wood tools hanging around and some basic skills. And so I just decided to build a guitar. (laughs) And now that's awesome. It's, you know, 13 years later or something like that. And it's flip-flopped, you know, it started out, I was mostly a consultant. That was my day job. And I would build guitars, you know, and sell a guitar here and there. And now I'm mostly a guitar builder and do a little consulting on the side. It's got a flip flipped, but that's all right. Yeah. It's so cool. And, and the guitars you're building are super, super cool. I, I need to, I need to pull up the list. Cause I, 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 I did earlier today pull up all the models, but it's been a long day. And so my brain is completely fried and everything that I put in it earlier today is left. <laughs> it's just gone. Um, but uh, so you got uh, it's it's not like a massive range, obviously. And that's the way, you know, uh, I think a lot of the good small builders and, and I always try to. I try to soften the word small builder because I feel like I'm being derogatory and I'm not. Right. It's not necessarily <laughs> an insult. No. Right. Exactly. Um, the, one of the things that, that happens that's so great is that you sort of get to hone in on these are what I do. Like I don't have to make something for everybody. I get right. to make these couple of things and I get to make them great. Uh, so you've got obviously the various, we were talking uh, just a little bit ago about the Mendocino. I'm, i I need a baritone in my life. I had a baritone last year and um, I made a financial decision last year. I bought a, I bought a baritone, one of the Dan Electro, you know, the sparkle black oh, yeah, yeah. baritones. And uh, then Phoebe Bridger smashed hers on SNL and the price on them skyrocketed. And I made oh. a financial decision. I'm going to sell this right now. The timing I'll, was good. Yeah. yeah. I'll come, I'll come back to this. <laughs> so I, I made a little money and uh, now I'm baritone less and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> need to need to go back to that as well but um you also make the uh the Folsom which is like the super cool single cutaway um the version I likes with the Bigsby y'all keep coming at me with torches and pitchforks <laughs> um everybody gets mad at me because I love Bigsby's I just I I like them. I do too they can work and they're it, fine they're fine exactly if if you can't keep a Bigsby in tune that's a you problem <laughs> Yep, that's not that's not a Bigsby problem. So anyway, and now that I've alienated over half of my listener base, um, so you get into building guitars, uh, and and how fast was the progress into realizing that I can do this like full time? We'll be right back. This podcast is supported in part by String Joy Strings. I'm a snob, at least that's what people tell me. I'm never okay with good enough, and that's where String Joy strings come in. They're better than good enough. They're the best. String Joy are making some of the finest strings available today right up the road from me in Nashville, Tennessee. They offer custom sets, balanced tension, coated strings, the works. If you need it, they can probably make it happen. 
you should be using Stringjoy strings. And if you're going to order from them, you really could help this podcast out by clicking the affiliate link down in the description or show notes below. You get amazing strings. I get a little bit of that back to help the show keep going. It's a win-win situation. Get your Stringjoy strings today. I would say I went at this um, very slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I didn't just when I when I decided I was going to build a guitar, I didn't you know jump up and down and say, "Look at me, I'm a guitar builder. Aren't, aren't I awesome? Come buy from me!" Right? I, right. I, it was like a, a kind of a personal journey of studying and learning and understanding and then building and then building some more. And I had probably built three or four guitars at least before I really even told anybody I was making guitars. Really. Yeah, because I my my thing is, you know, when you when you build that first guitar, it's a really great personal accomplishment. Yeah. But the world couldn't care less. Some random yeah. dude built one guitar or whatever. You know, how impressive is that really? Right. Uh, other than to you and your, your mom, you know, I don't know. But so um, and, you know, maybe it's a little bit of my business background, having worked in corporations for a lot of years and in, in, in marketing and advertising, you know, having to interface with all of that, because I understood that that. uh you're not really a company because you built a guitar. Right. At least I don't f- didn't feel that way. Like, what am I going to do? Put up a website and <laughs> for your have, one guitar, for my one guitar, <laughs> or like six different pictures with different backgrounds, you know, Photoshop yeah. it into different colors. <laughs> Look, I've made three. There's a red one and a blue one. And a, <laughs> so I'm calling out those small business owners to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. There's nothing yeah, wrong with it. It's not yeah. my thing, you know? So I've sort of, and it's also uh, for me a part of like honing the craft, like that first guitar I built, it was all right. It was pretty good. It was enough to motivate me to build more. Yeah. But it was a first guitar to, you know, let's be real about it. Um, so by guitar f- four or five or six, I kind of had something going on. I was starting to get a feel for what I wanted to do. Right. Not just, yeah. oh, I built something. Uh, but what, st- you know, starting to have a theme behind what is Grez guitar is going to be. Um, so I probably didn't even put up a website until I'd been building guitars for three or four years. Oh, wow. Um, and I mean, I probably had, I had sold a few at that point, but I wasn't really trying hard to be a company and sell things. Right. Um, You're still doing the consultant thing full time at that point. I was. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I, you know, if you think about it, like the first year you build a guitar, maybe the second year you build two or three, you're not, you know, this is no great shakes. Yeah. Um, but then, um, I, was designing various models and sometimes things just come together. You know, you have these random ideas. It's kind of like when things come into focus, I've done this, I built that, this makes sense. This is cool. That didn't work. And then it's sort of like, there's the Mendocino. It just, everything came into focus with that. And I decided, (laughs) okay, I'm going to stop building guitars randomly one off and I'm going to have a model. Right. And I'm going to push this model. This, this is to me, it felt like this is like worthy. It's, it's unique, but, but still a little mainstream, not weird. And, and it has good manufacturability and an interesting look and it sounds really cool. Or so I think it's light. Um, so I, you know, it, it just took a little while to like nail the thing that I was going to really push forward with. And once I did that, then I totally, you know, hammered down and you know, started going to trade shows and getting print ads and, and, and then it quickly went from, you know, 12 a year to, to 20, to 40, to 60, to 80, you know, and so. How many are you making a year now? This year, uh, I will probably ship 70 to 80 guitars this year, some, something like that. Oh, wow. So basically one or two a week is kind of the, you know, on any given week, I should be shipping one or two guitars. Okay. Uh, are you still I building them all entirely yourself? You got apprentice, I've got help staff? Now. Four, okay. four days a week, I have help. Not quite okay. full time, but. But uh, um, that's when I think you're a company, by the way, when you have to hire someone, that's yeah. when you're a company, when you're it, it, even if it's just, hey, I need you to come in and just take the orders like and turn, right. the, you know, so I can I can focus on the building. Let me not touch a computer like let me, you know, just do the building that you're a company now because you're employing yeah. someone. <laughs> that's that's when you really cross that line. Uh, to me, and, no, no and, shade on the solo small business owners. Yeah. And I'm also uh, very atypical. Uh-huh. Like I, 
um, the normal trajectory is, is as somebody like me becomes more well known and, and you're, you, you can charge a little more and, you know, eventually maybe you're charging five, eight, 10, 12 grand for a guitar and you build 10 a year. And the math says you can make a living on 10 right. guitars at 10 grand a piece. Right. Right. That's a, that's a living. Um, but all of my friends can't buy $10,000 guitars. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to make a living off of a $3,000 guitar, you know, which yeah. isn't cheap, but it isn't crazy expensive, right? A, a professional musician will spend that on a tool to do the job. Yeah. And, um, and uh, honestly, the hobbyist musician at this point, you know, I was just having this discussion, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, how the, the entry point for guitars price wise. Yeah. While right now there are better affordable guitars than ever before, Absolutely. I find that the the average buyer is a lot more willing now than even three, four years ago to drop two grand, two and a half grand. It sort of feels like two and a half grand has become the almost expected like right. pro level instrument, even from a not small maker. Like whenever yeah. I see a small builder, I'm going to use the term boutique, um, which is a funky term anyway. That's F U N K y'all no explicit marker. I'm fine. Um, so far. Um, it, if I see a boutique maker selling their guitars for less than three grand, I already, I immediately know they're still new at this because right. their guitars should be bra There should be a three at the front. It's hard. I mean, I would love to sell these for 28, which is, which is what I did for a while. Yeah. Um, but I just, I can't, Yeah. you know, it, I can't, can't quite make a go of it at that with all things considered, you know, with all the expenses and especially being in California, you know, property is not cheap here. No, um, that overheads, it's rough. It, it's a lot. So, um, so I have to sell 60, 70, 80 guitars a year for, for it to add up to enough at the end of the day that there's, you know, but I keep going. Yeah. Uh, but that's no. not the normal outlook. You know, most boutique builders are thinking about how do I, how do I get to six grand for my guitar, seven, eight grand right. for my guitar. Uh, so, uh, so in a way I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know if I'm not boutique or I'm just like boutique production. Some like <laughs> a weird, like, I don't know what, what, uh, like, I don't know how many guitars a year, um, like Doug Cower makes or, uh, uh, Frank brothers, you know, I suspect yeah. they're even a little bit bigger, bigger than I am, uh, but still boutique, but it's that sort sure. of like that weird middle ground where you're a boutique, but you're still a little bit of a production shop. You know, we're not just making a guitar a month. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like how I think of a company like, uh, I talk about a lot on the podcast, Novo, they've sort of grown maybe almost on the edge of that, not boutique anymore. Almost. <laughs> I, th I think they're right there. Um, uh, but it's like, uh, Doug is definitely, I'd, I'd call, you know, he's a boutique guitar maker, although his sure. were sold in Guitar Center. I mean, congratulations, Doug. I mean, that's that's awesome. But it's also, at some point, you got to like, what is the definition? What is your production level that, oh, you can't, once you make a hundred guitars a year, you're not boutique anymore. You know, it's like. Yeah, I don't know. What, what, yeah, what are the rules and who says What are the rules? <laughs> Does everyone have to be, you know uh matt oram at fidelity you know making I, yeah. I don't even know how many matt makes but there's not a whole lot of fidelity guitars out there um, yeah and I, I don't know that i would want to pin something like this you know saying oh novo's not boutique because they make more yeah. than 100 i mean that's just crazy right. right they're great guitars uh you know well crafted <laughs> good designs yeah. so it almost becomes a question of well what does boutique even mean what does it mean? That's why I always yeah. use air quotes around it because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, that's right up there with transparent overdrive or yeah. amp like or violin like sustain. Y'all stop it. Just, yep. just stop it. But yeah, boutique, uh, I prefer to just consider, think of it as small builder or, um, cause there's, there's lots of guys out there who are doing like you did at the beginning uh, building one-off guitars. They're just like, they're just taking orders. Like, what do you want? And I'll build yeah. it. And, and that's, that's totally great, but that can't, that's not a living. No, that's, and that's, and that's, and that's I'm not, not throwing any branding. shade, but that's not yeah, branding. That's not right. So it's, it's just a different, uh, like if you build a couple of guitars a year as a hobby and make a little money, right. They could be excellent guitars and that's awesome. 
So it's it's just uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of those folks are probably wise enough to say, I don't want to do this for a living. It's too much work. Yeah. I'm going to keep it as a hobby where it's fun. That's, Look at uh, you know, perfectly uh, Alex, Alex Sorokin in, uh, I can't remember what part of Canada he's in. Uh, he's the one who's built the guitars that Joey Landreth plays. And oh, yeah. he doesn't, he is building guitars. He's got a great Instagram if you want to follow it. He takes beautiful pictures of the work he does. But he literally just tells you, I don't take orders. I don't. Like, you can't contact me and ask me to build you something. It's like, I build guitars as a hobby. When they're built, if you want to buy them, here they are. Yeah. And that's just what he does. That's super cool. I think I, I just come from a background of more of a production. And it just, that's what makes <laughs> yeah. sense to me, right? Is, de- is, is designing something that you can make efficiently, but making it efficient. Because it's designed to be made efficiently doesn't necessarily also mean that it's not amazing. Right. right. Like to, to me, that's like part of the art of good design is that it looks good. It's easy to make. Uh, it can be profitable. It sounds good. All, everything should be right. Right. That That's a win. Yeah. And it's it's like the I remember when it was a, a stigma. I, I think it still might be a little bit, but I think it's going away. Um, like when CNC first started getting introduced into the industry. Uh, now, yeah. obviously, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, I'm going to drop some Mississippi knowledge on you. Um, PV was the first, as far as we're aware, PV was the first company in America to start using a CNC machine to start cutting their guitars. Ooh, uh, if somebody, that. if somebody can drop an earlier company, please do. But that was how that was how Hartley PV and the company decided to start changing the way they made guitars in America. Uh, because it, that was during an age when a lot of people were starting to outsource, you know, they're more affordable, yep. they're easier to make line overseas. So he got a CNC and was like, I'll just start cutting the bodies this way. And that's where a lot of those early uh, PV guitars, the consistency came from is that they were able mm-hmm. to make these really consistent guitars. They also weighed a 4 million pounds. Um, but that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that's more, but that goes back to design, right? Not a thorough yes. and complete design. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, so they, they weren't thinking of ever thinking about everything when they designed it. Yeah. But since then, you know, guys, I'm going to, I'm going to break a little mystique for you. If you're not aware, Ernie Ball uses a CNC, you know, Novo is on a CNC. Uh, a Doug Cower cuts a lot on a CNC. You know what I mean? Like that's yep. the way you can do it by this really big expensive machine so that it does a lot of the, bulk of the work so that you can do the more important things that your hands actually need to do yep. to, to, to craft a, a quality guitar. And yeah, so yeah, I think I've some of the stigma is going away. I've got a small CNC and it doesn't build guitars, but it cuts out little parts for me. Right. And, and, you know, b- before having the CNC, I would cut a lot of this on a pin router, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, and if you're not, let's just say it's it's a big, dangerous machine that makes a lot of noise, takes a lot of space. And and um, so, you know, I don't know if I'm cutting out um, the shape of a body on the pin router. It's dirty, it's dangerous, it's loud. And there's no art to that because I've already made a template and I'm just pushing the body along the template or the router along the template. You know, there's no artisanal component to this. It's right. just cutting something out. So you might as well have the CNC cut that perimeter for you because it's more accurate. It's safer. I don't have my hands anywhere near a bit. It's way cleaner. Uh, the fact that the CNC, the dust collection is right at the bit of a CNC. The uh-huh. shop is so much cleaner, Yeah, it, which makes a difference. Um, <clears throat> and it, for me, because uh, it's kind of low volume here, really, right? Like uh, it, it can do it while I'm at lunch. So I don't even have to listen to it. Oh yeah, you can walk. So away. I put a yeah, I put a body blank on the on the thing. I hit go. I go to lunch. I come back. Eh, it's cut out. It's just yeah. So it's great. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm really curious, and the I'm I've never asked this question before because but there's got to be what. Let's say you do that like every day. You put one blank on. You go to lunch. That way you're not even listening to the machine. Yep. What's the uh, what's the failure rate on that? How often does we come back and there's an unusable body? <laughs> oh gosh, well not so much anymore. You know, okay. there's a learning curve. <laughs> um, yeah, this especially having never owned or operated a CNC. 
right? Luckily, right. I have I had CAD experience from product design, so drawing something I could do and had done. And but yeah, the CNC was a learning curve. Um, and well, first of all, the body blank on uh-huh. average is a hundred dollar bill. Okay, right. I mean, right. a giant chunk of redwood or a giant chunk of mahogany. I use off a lot of Honduran mahogany, one piece body blanks. You know, easily it's a hundred dollars. Right. So every time you make a mistake, that's just a hundred dollar <laughs> bill gone, you know, psh, gone, gone. Uh, you know, or if you break the bit, right, that's eighty dollars gone. Ugh. Um, so you try not to break too many. Um, and uh, I don't know how many I've wasted. Not a horrible amount. But yeah. it hurts. It hurts when it, you it hurts do. every time. It does. It really does. And one of the things is it's about um, uh, speed. So you want to, you can imagine the faster you push this router bit through the wood, the, the more torque is on that wood. Right. So how well you clamp that piece of wood down is really important. So your fixturing can only withstand a certain amount of pressure. So you got to slow the machine down until it's not exceeding the strength of your fixturing. And you know, so you start out thinking, well, I'm going to go slow and be super accurate. And then you realize this thing machine is designed to go four times faster. Let's crank it up. Right. And then parts go flying off the <laughs> bed. And OK, so somewhere in between is a speed that, you know, gets this part cut at a reasonable amount of time, but also doesn't exceed my clamping force holding the part down, let's say. Yeah. I don't I, know. I, boring I, stuff, but learning curves. Yeah. See, I, I find it interesting. Like I. I, I'm that guy who's like, oh, I wish I had my own CNC. And then, like, all I would end up doing is, like, making the most ridiculous little things. Like, I'd never do anything productive with it. So <laughs> it's a good thing I don't have one because I would never do anything useful. I would – I would, I, 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 can't even say some of the stupid things I do because I don't want that out there forever <laughs> on the internet. Um, but, like, that's what I would do. Um, they, they fascinate me as a machine, though, just CNC in general – uh, I, I love all of the maker culture. I'm a librarian. It's part of the part of the thing. Uh, I love 3D printers and I love um, I've always been trying to convince my wife to let me get a MIG welder because um, mm. I really want to start doing metal sculpture. <laughs> OK, uh, that's what I want to do. Um, but uh, she is so thus far. She is she is Nick's the MIG uh, welder she she just doesn't think she thinks i'll hurt myself it's not a money thing i think she just thinks i'll hurt myself she's probably not wrong um so but i, I love the idea but some of that stigma is going away finally finally builders don't have to sit there and you know hand saw like if you want that go go find some of those folks on etsy they'll be happy to accommodate you and yeah. pay the bill um, yeah, the classic example is like fretboard slots. Yeah. Fret slots in your fretboard, excuse me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, you know, you start out maybe with with a ruler and you make marks and you measure where the frets are going to go and you got a little box, uh, what do you call it, a uh, uh, um, miter box uh, and you're cutting it. the fret slots. And then, you know, you, you get the template with a special bit for your table saw. So the template registers in the right spots and... But, or the CNC just cuts them in the, the right darn place. I mean, the <laughs> right. right place. It, is that, that's not bad, right? That's not, there's no soul sucked out of the guitar. <laughs> right. It, this isn't, this isn't a Ghostbusters trap that pulls in <laughs> all of the mojo out of the, out of the wood. Yeah. It's yeah. literally making sure that your guitar is in tune when you play yeah. it. But then there's plenty of folks who, couldn't care less about CNC and are making everything by hand. And that's cool too. Right. Yeah. It's just, to me, it's just whatever. It's a fancier router and routers are acceptable. Yeah. Um, so I've, yeah. I've dropped a lot of the stigma around uh, the more guitars I play, the more people I talk to, especially, and this is the big one, the more players, the more pro players, the more pro musicians, which is something I thought I wanted to do a long time ago with my life. Um, turns out I was way wrong. Um, it's, uh, the more of them I talk to, the less I start to care about certain things. <laughs> One, the the term "handmade," like I, the, the it it's such a I'm such a nebulous term, term anyway. Now. Yeah, yeah. Like, what was it? I'm and I'm gonna I'm gonna totally. I hope no one from Dr. Strings listens to this podcast. But um, Dr. Strings, their big thing used to be handmade strings. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, you use a machine that you guide with your hand, and like. You know, strings are one of those things. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a maker. I, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole. But 
what how much of the guitar has to be made by hand before you have to you before you can use the handmade moniker right yeah yeah it's like do i do i need to completely carve the the neck profile from a just square block of wood uh you know did i have to hand saw that block of wood yeah it's did i cut the tree down (laughs) right did i cut the tree oh that and that's there there's folks out there too but like things like um i don't even know which you do so this will tell you um poly versus nitro i'm like "Ah, it doesn't it doesn't matter that much i like them both um i love i love gibson guitars i'm an unabashed gibson guitar fan um nitro guitars you know what i also love doug cower guitars and those are poly it's a thin poly but it's poly you know? I, and that's what I think matters is the 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 thinness. Yes, matters more than the the uh, material itself. Yeah, right. You could put too much nitro on a guitar. I suppose, also, right? also, there's the environmental and health am- impacts of nitro as well <laughs> that need to be taken right. into account. Um, if if people are spraying nitro for your guitar, you're also paying for their health. You better be paying for their health insurance in the price of the guitar because that's a problem. Um, so I think it's cool. I, I love the guitars you're building. Uh, I like the fact that you've really honed in on, I, what if you got five models of the Mendocino or is it six? If I count the bass. Yeah. With the new bass, let's see, there's Mendocino, Mendocino junior, the baritone, the bass. And now I've got a couple of double cut versions. So five ish, five or six. Yeah. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I, I, I remember so I've been following you on Instagram for a while, um, both uh, my personal account and and from the the uh, podcast. And when you announced the bass, it was right when I was sort of in the I need another bass. I have a P bass <laughs> I have a, that I've had for years and I love it. But but of course, I always need more gear. That's that's a whole thing we're going to talk about in a second. That desire for more stuff. Um, but I, I remember when I saw that one, I was like, oh, I might need to. But I, I've held off. Yeah. Because one, I don't, I don't get that many bass gigs <laughs> and I'm not recording a whole bunch right now. So I'm like, yep. the one bass is fine, Philip. You barely play it. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need to spend that much money on what is undoubtedly an amazing bass, but that's a lot of money tied up into an instrument you're not going to play. Like, yeah. You're going to use not, it once a month, maybe. Right. Exactly. So. Um, before we get started for recording, uh, we had this whole conversation talking about the the stuff, and this has been something that's on my brain today. So, um, listeners, by the time you're listening to this, these have passed, so I will not be endangering your gear acquisition syndrome at all. Um, but it's the, well, actually, the Fourth of July sale will still be going on. <laughs> um, but the Sweetwater sales will have ended from Sweetwater's Gear Fest and whatnot. I have been so suckered in in the last two and a half, three days by all of these gear sales. And I've had my finger over the purchase button more than once, just staring at it. Oh, oh, that's really cool. I could totally uh, stop because there's a, I've had this nagging thing recently where it's like, I have so much stuff. I have so much gear. Mm-hmm. And, uh, do you, do you find you come across that a whole bunch? It's got to be different for someone who's making instruments. Is it different? Well, it well it, it is from the standpoint of there's an awful lot of guitars here, but they don't count, right? Because they're demo guitars. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's not part of my collection. That's <laughs> that's that's so, part of work. That's part of work. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just if I look around the room here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seventy nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. 17 you know just looking around yeah. it's just within eye shot um i was know. really i was really glad when you crossed my number i was really happy <laughs> when you crossed that one because but uh, a bunch of these are old beater demo guitars that i you know lend out to people and i've had them sure yeah you know, they're not my although some of them are my collection per se right things that i have just because because i love them yeah even yeah. if i don't really play them that often but you want to see Sure, sure. We'll take a peek. Super quick. Bad podcasting, yeah. I know. Yeah, bad podcasting, good YouTubing. Yeah, we'll turn the camera. So there's a oh, yeah. Jeff Tweed ESG and a, oh, a Gretsch uh, Country Club and a whole bunch of Grez guitars down there and just a bunch of, we're talking about gear, right? 
cool yeah. plants and stuff. And all right, enough of that. <laughs> <laughs> got some got some rad old amps. So I know, and actually, it's the first time I've mentioned. Uh, I know that you are a uh, a sponsor of the uh, Truth About Vintage Amps podcast uh, yes. with Skip Simmons and uh, Jason Verlindi over there at the Fretboard Journal. Um, got a lot of really cool old amps. That's been a thing that I've been sort of not getting into because it's such a dangerous rabbit hole for someone who has a hoarder mentality for gear like I do. Because yeah. a lot of those cool older amps are they're really affordable. They're really easy to grab if you can stumble yeah. across them. But it's, I saw you've got harder, a but I saw you've got a cool a few cool older amps over there. What's your uh what's your coolest coolest amp? Not necessarily best sounding. What's your like raddest piece you've managed to collect? That's an excellent question. Um, I think it might be this little brown amp called Comco, C-O-M-C-O. It's brown with a little brown square with probably an eight inch speaker and little white racing stripes on it. Got it at a garage sale for $25. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it worked for a few years and then it blew up. And then a friend of mine who's an amp builder built a, uh, single ended class A Princeton into it, which I guess is more, more, maybe that's more like a champ. Yeah. So he rebuilt. Or, or a Harvard. Maybe. I think it's, oh, yeah, the Princeton. I get all those mixed up. I think he took the Princeton circuit, but a single output tube. So it's class okay. A Princeton. Got it. Whatever. Anyway, but it still is this super cool looking little amp and it's, you know, plug it into a one by 12 extension cab and it's just freaking awesome. That's love it. I love, I love cool little rad things like that little, you, you can't explain them. They're just a thing. Uh, there's a vibe to, to certain yep. things and you, you can't really argue with vibes. Sometimes I picked up a, uh, uh, a harmony rebel H 82, something like that. I can't remember. Um, okay. actually I'll grab it here in a second. Again, wonderful podcasting. Uh, it's okay. People, if you want to see what it looks like, you can go back to go, go over to my Instagram. Y'all, you can scroll to back a ways. You can see a picture of it. I posted it. Um, I bought it from Fanny's House of Music in Nashville because I'd been wanting. I'm a blues guy. I, I've always been a blues guy. I'm from Mississippi. I'm from the Mississippi Delta specifically. It's in the blood. Um, and I I wanted something cool from that era. But the problem with guitars from that era, especially those, you know, department store guitars, mm-hmm. they are either amazing or they are complete trash. Yep. And there's not really much of an in-between. And because this one was from a trusted a seller I trusted, I knew it would be good. Let me see if I can reach it with my headphones. Yeah, yeah. And, w- and while you're doing that, I'll just say that's a little bit of what's what was the inspiration behind the Mendocino, is to be a little yeah. bit like those department store guitars, but actually built well and playing properly. And yeah, and, and you'll you'll see some of those in... Oh, yeah, I, wow. Look at That's a lot of switches. Yeah, it's it's actually let me see if I can do this without being able to see it. It's got sliders oh, instead of knobs <laughs> for volume and tone. <laughs> okay. And uh Fanny's uh replaced the stock bridge with a sure. a Bigsby. Um again, I love Bigsby's, but um the stock was terrible. It was it was absolutely terrible. But it's such a cool guitar, uh such a rad just vibey piece. Yep. Uh, gold foils. It's got the original De Armin gold foils on it. Yeah, that's great sounding stuff. Yeah. So anyway, that was me. That was the section of the podcast that was entirely for my own edification, talking about cool old stuff, because I, I yeah. love hearing about people's like raddest piece they've got, because there's always that. So everyone has that vibe piece. So I'm is... a little bit more obsessed with amps than guitars. Are you? From a bo- because, well, I have lots of guitars and I can sure. make more. And so, but you know, amp, so I guess for what, it, because of that, I'm always looking at amps more than guitars, you know, cool old amps or even new boutique amps. There are so many like yeah. super cool builders right now of amplifiers. Uh, you know, you just can't afford to own all of the cool stuff you'd like to own, but there's so much good stuff out there right now. Yeah. I've, I've got a few that I love the amps, but at the same time I have limited budget and so I'm thinking about like literally today I was thinking about, well, if I sold those amps, I could get these and try these out. You know what I mean? Cause I yeah. can only, can only have so much at one time. And when you're I, not gigging much anymore, I'd love to I'm working on getting out there a bunch more, but you know, I'm playing like, I don't know, 
15, 20 gigs a year now, like at most, that's the most I'm doing. And I've got like, I've got three different amps with two by 12 cabs. And I'm like, when are you using these, yeah. Philip? When are you playing out where you need this? So uh, I, I love amps. And if I could, I'd have them all. I'm sorry. I have four amps with two by 12 cabs. I just remembered another one. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a thing. I would, I would collect all of the amps. Uh, I will look at an amp before I'll look at a guitar or a yeah. pedal, to be really honest. I'm much more likely to get into an amp. Um, and if it's got a tremolo or vibrato circuit in it, even better. And yeah, yeah, I do toward, toward uh, lean towards the stuff with that built in, even though a lot of what I have doesn't just because that's how it goes. But yeah, yeah. I'm always happy when they do if well, if they're good, at least. Yeah. yeah. If they're and, built in and they're good, they're, that's the. <laughs> I, I kind of like it when they're not good and just find a way to make <laughs> it work. It's like this is this only has like this one sound, but it's pretty cool if you can find right. a place for it. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Um, it, this has been on my brain all day today as I've been like staring at guitars and amps and pedals. And there has to come a place where we as, as guitar players and guitar collectors and just hoarders, I'm going to use the term. I'm just going to use it. I'm just going to say, um, uh, burgeoning hoarders, um, <laughs> where you have to be like, I, I don't, I don't have to have everything. Like I don't have to get by everything and have it in my house. That's why I, I, I like accumulating friends who have stuff so I can just borrow it <laughs> and send it back. That's that's the real uh, hoarding you need to do. Hoard gear friends. Right. Um, Trusted people you can swap gear with. You need to know it's going to come back. But Yeah, absolutely. So circling back, I because I wanted to circle back to the Folsom. I wanted to talk about it for hmm. a second because it's got a little bit of that that quirky vibe to it too. I mean, if I were to just describe the specs, like without with, if I didn't, you know, show a picture or I didn't tell anybody exactly, you know, I'd be like, Oh, it's, you know, a two pickup double cut with, and you know, you, you, you could give people a description. They're going to have an idea. It's not what you think. <laughs> so you need to check it right. out. So where'd the inspiration for that model come from? Cause I got to know specifically Paul Bigsby's guitars. Okay, that that was yeah. one of the ones that was on my radar. Right. So, so the the Mendocino, I feel like, is built a little bit like a Bigsby guitar was built, and okay. a little bit like the, the the harmonies and other guitars which came later. Um, if you look at the guts, like how they're constructed, um, a little Bigsby ish, but it doesn't look Bigsby at all. It's just the concept behind its design or construction. So the but the Folsom is kind of the opposite. It's it's solid body guitar. It's not uh -huh. big Bigsby like in construction, but the aesthetic is definitely a nod to what Paul Bigsby was building. Yeah, it's um, got not, that... not not a knockoff. You know, I mean, guys like TK Smith and a few other people are building like really high end, amazing, uh, super Bigsby inspired instruments. This is just more of a nod to Bigsby. It's not so on the nose. Yeah, I I, I think I especially see it, especially in that that the cutaway and the horn. Uh, I see it there. I also see a little bit of like, uh, and that this is probably is also Bigsby design, a little bit of that Italian uh, guitar influence. Maybe I, I, I love the crazy Italian guitar builds. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we don't get a lot of those down here in Mississippi. They don't, they don't make their way. We get all the, the crazy old Japanese stuff and the, you know, but yeah. So, so I, uh, I have some old drawings of Bigsby guitars really? from a guy named R.C. Allen, who was a a young young guy who kind of hung out in Paul Bigsby's shop. wasn't officially Paul's apprentice, but just you know apparently one of the few people that P.A. Bigsby would let hang out in his shop. And so <laughs> R.C. Allen eventually became a guitar builder in his own right, and. Um, even owned a, a few uh, Bigsby guitars. Uh, but anyway, so he had these sketches of Bigsby's guitars. Uh, and I ended up with a bunch of his stuff after he passed away. And in this pile of stuff uh, was this drawing. Uh, it's a, so it's basically like a, like a blueprint, like a hand drawing of a Bigsby guitar. Uh, I don't believe it was drawn by Paul Bigsby. I believe it was probably drawn by R.C. Allen. Uh, so it's not necessarily valuable, sure. but it's just a super cool piece, right? A drawing of a Bigsby guitar 
drawn by Bigsby's apprentice. Maybe you can call him that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I'm staring at the sure, thing. I had, can call I had it it's framed. Fine. It's on the wall. I stare at it all the time. And so the shape just uh, made its way, you know. I yeah. sort of I generally don't like to make copies of things and steal things. I kind of want to design my own thing. Yeah. But this is just just obscure enough that I felt like I could lift the shape because I'm not really copying everything about a Bigsby. I'm, you know. Well, I you know, I, yeah. in guitar making, I've talked about this with past guests. It's so hard to be truly original, like completely yep. original. Not only because so much has been done, but because so much has been done and failed <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, let's, let's be honest. Uh, yeah. If you can think of it, someone's probably tried it. And if you don't see it on a lot of guitars, there's a reason. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very difficult industry because guitar players are asses. Um, and uh, there I said it, uh, we're traditionalists. I'm a traditionalist. Even yeah. even you modern folks who want to say, oh, you, you're a modern player, you are yourself. You have your traditions that you are latching on to that are part of your instrument making uh, and the way the instruments you like. I know what mine are. I just admit them. Um, I know what my biases are. Um, and so we have these things that we like that have been sort of accepted as proper guitar yep. building and styles. And most of them were written in the 50s and 60s. And so it's hard to find your own thing and really make it your own, which, which is what I think uh, the Mendocino especially does very well. It's very much its own thing. It doesn't look like anything out there, but it has aspects like yes, you see. It's not, it's not like it came from aliens. It still right, looks exactly. like the guitar, but yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not the new uh, Tosin Abasi that, that Ernie Ball is <laughs> making now. Right. I'm I'm not gonna rip on it. I'm not gonna rip on it. I'm not gonna rip on it. I'm sure it plays incredible because Ernie Ball makes great guitars and Tosin is a great player, but it looks like a weapon from World of Warcraft. <laughs> um so um yeah. But it, something it you said is uh interesting to me because it as a again as a product designer, um uh, this is the thought process that happens all the time is you have some stupid idea, mm -hmm. you think, wow, I'm brilliant, I've just had this idea, and then you do a little research and you realize you know, A, it's already been done. Yeah. B, it's already been tried and it's not being done because it's a dumb idea, you know, or C, <laughs> maybe you are brilliant and you should do it and you're the first one to think about it, but it's almost never C, right? Almost never. So. Almost yeah, never like, C. There's a, there's a lot of fixing problems that don't exist um, in C. Uh, well, in things you right. think are C. Um, yeah. I, I've had them. I've, I've come up with things that I thought this is going to be the thing that makes me rich. <laughs> And then I realized yep. it was the I was creating a problem so that I could solve it. It's like this isn't an That's issue. Right. Um, and even the things that solve problems, they're not even problems to everybody. It's kind of like stainless steel frets, right? Yeah. To the devoted, it's solving a problem and it's the most amazing thing ever. But to other people, it's solving a problem that doesn't exist. Like most people who buy a guitar and they play non-professionally will never wear the frets out on their guitar. Right. Yeah. The, so it's, the so only it's solving a problem that isn't existing for most people. Not that it doesn't exist for some people, but it is, yeah, it's not. Otherwise, all guitars now would be made with stainless steel frets. It's exactly uh, the only guitars I have that need fret work, um, or I don't think I have anything that needs a refret. But I have a couple of pieces that are probably getting close to needing uh, the next crown. Might be the last one, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, those are the guitars I was playing when I was playing 120, 130 nights a year. Right. Those are the guitars that I was playing then. And those are the ones that need the work. All the stuff I have now that since then, no, <laughs> they're never <laughs> right. going to need fret work. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. When you have a number one and you're gigging hard. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You might wear out those frets. Yeah, exactly. And, but. and you know, depending on your string choices too, or the pressure you play with or all those yes. other things too. There's a lot of people who just don't play with enough pressure to ever do that, to ever wear That's the right. frets out like well, that. Not entirely against stainless steel frets, but it's like an example of it solves a problem, but it's only a problem for some people. It's for other people. Yes. It's not solving a problem. There is no problem. Yeah. Or what was the debate last year that raged for a little bit about 
someone made the claim that Gibson frets were in the wrong place and that's why they had tuning issues or why they were it, it, it hard to intonate. And then like other people are like, I've never had a problem playing this guitar in tune. It's like, why is this a problem? Why is this yeah. suddenly a problem now? Um, based on the numbers that you've run <laughs> saying mathematically, yeah. this is out of tune and you need to move the frets. Yeah. Cause they're never in tune. So yeah. they're all, there's all these little tiny schemes to try to get them a little more in tune, but yeah, you know, exactly. Th- down to the compensated, going to the compensated nuts and all of that sort of stuff. And you go down the rabbit hole if you want, but yeah, the, uh, it's not a problem for most people. It's not a problem for most people. It's just, it's just not, there was a, what, do you remember the string Butler? You seen those? Oh, totally. The, yeah. 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 That, that solves a problem that in theory is a problem in practice. Yeah. Eh, you know, you know, uh, uh, Gibson guitars stay in tune, I guess. Yeah. I mean, maybe they would stay in tune better with the string Butler with, with a straighter pull, I guess, but I don't know. <laughs> Whatever. They work. Yeah. <laughs> they, they work. Exactly. But, guitar players are a weird lot and I'm including myself in this. Uh, once again, look at my bias against the new Tosin Avasi Ernie ball guitar. <laughs> I mean, it, that was my, that's my gut reaction based on my biases. And we we're still playing guitars that were designed 60 years ago, you know, actually more than that. Now if the yep. strat came out. I mean, the telly came out in what? 50, 51, in the broadcaster, no caster. Sure. You know. A version yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. A version of it came out in 72 years ago. And still today you can buy that model that get yeah. essentially that That's guitar. Right. And so we hold on to traditions. And so it's always hard to, to find your mark, to find your voice, your style and be able to market it and make a move on it. And you've done a really good job with that, with especially with the Mendocino, because that's that's your model that I hear everyone talk about. Every that everyone I've talked to about Grez thing. guitars, yeah. that's that's the one they talk about. I think that's why I gravitated to the Folsom. I'm like, yeah, but look at this. This is cool. <laughs> you know, this is rad. Yeah. Um, so do you have do you have any plans for other models? You got some things cooking? Well, you know, I just released the bass version yeah. of the Mendocino, and earlier this year I started making the double cut version. Two different two different versions of double cuts. On yeah. the Mendocino. So one of them is a Mendocino double cut that looks a little more tulipy. Okay. And then one of them is slightly bigger and more Gibson-y. Not by any means a 335, but, gotcha. but just a touch bigger and a touch more traditional in the cutaway shape. Um, okay. And um, so for the moment, it's just focusing on making all of this stuff and <laughs> keeping up with production and yeah um you know there's 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 always a list of like things i want to do like i would love to build a mendocino with an arched top so it'd be fully hollow oh that would be so rad oh my right? gosh so it'd be please a, do a that. super miniature sort of arch top because the back wouldn't be arched but yeah. i would love to build one of those you know i don't know if that's worthy of a model or just something i'll build someday for the fun of it um, I would love to build a Mendocino with a metal top. So the same frame, but instead of the redwood top, a metal top. So it wouldn't be a resonator, but it would right. have some clanginess to it. Yeah. Um, all sorts of little things I would like to do, but there's, I don't know, not enough hours in the day as it is. At this <laughs> not point. at all. So. I'm still convinced some people have 28 hours in their day and I want to know how they pulled that off. But um, please yeah. do the arch top. That sounds so rad. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. sounds so awesome. Uh, but I am a I am an arch top. Uh, I I love arch top guitars. So, um, I, my my dream guitar for a long long time was a one seventy five, and mm. I'm still yet to realize that dream, which doesn't make any sense. I have a lot of guitars. I yeah. could easily have gotten a one seventy five by now, but. Yeah. Uh, and I still I think, make arch tops and acoustic guitars and all these other things. It's just not the main thing. Like you're saying, Ma- okay. you know, it's mostly Mendocinos followed by Folsom's followed by one off custom commissioned steel string, flat top acoustics or, you know, 17 inch arch tops or, so I, I still do some of that. Um, but those are smaller numbers. Like I'm only building, you know, six or five or six custom things a year, like super custom, like acoustic you. guitars and, 
Yeah, like uh, do you, so when you when you're building those, are those just purely for your own interests or your own trying to learn a technique, or do you actually take an order every now and again for a crazy custom build? Well, I I, I guess what it is, it's more of a legacy thing. Um, okay. So before I got to the Mendocino, I actually I started out building acoustic guitars. Oh wow! And then sort of semi hollow bodies, and then I ended up building arch tops, and so I've never never basically taken all those old models and gotten rid of them and said, all we do are Mendocinos and Folsoms. Gotcha. So mainly we do Mendocinos and Folsoms, but if you scroll through the website, there's like a little page of custom stuff and there's 15 inch, 16, 17, 18 inch arch tops of all sorts that I can make. And, and so I just take orders for those sometimes, you know, cause if you're, if you've got a, you know, like a vintage ES 350 that you're touring with, it's a valuable instrument and it's slowly falling apart from the abuse of the road. Yeah. And so you might come to somebody like me and say, Hey, can you build me something very much like this old ES 350? But while we're at it, let me customize it. I want these inlays and I want, you know, I want the body to be whatever. And then I can leave my vintage one at home for recording and I'll take yours out on the road. Um, yeah. And so those are the sort of things I do from time to time. Um, although admittedly those are becoming harder and harder to do because the mentality is just different. Like the brain space shift from making Mendocinos and Folsoms to stopping and, okay, we're going to laminate some arch top plates now. It's just, you know. Totally different style It messes with building. the workflow a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have a hard time just transitioning from lunch to after lunch work. So <laughs> um, I can't imagine completely shifting the style of building something to yeah because it is it's a completely different style yeah it's it's a totally but i enjoy building world. acoustic guitars and arch tops and um but they're too labor intensive it would be too hard to make a living building those unless you took that route we talked about where you charge a lot for them which i yeah, don't want charge to a lot for them and uh hire more help <laughs> right yeah so i keep them as like random custom-y things that's very cool. I'm going to have to take a peek at those because I had not looked at those yet to see, see what other things were hunt, uh, <laughs> lurking around your website while I was looking at the models you offer. Um, well, actually, we're, we're rounding out pretty close to the hour here. And so we're going we're gonna to start to wrap this episode up and we're going to go over to the Patreon episode. Listeners, you heard at the top of the show. Uh, Patreon my supporters are how this show can keep happening. Uh, if you're enjoying the show, please go over to patreon.com slash 40 watt podcast. You can support the show for as little as I think $3 a month or as much as like $50 a month. And I think at $50, I give lessons at that point. You get to steal some of my time. Uh, that's guitar, keys, bass. I'll teach you music theory. Uh, if you want to learn music theory, God bless you. Um, yeah, I will. I will go down that rabbit hole. But as I started last uh, episode, I am going to start thanking my uh, Patreon supporters by name uh, at the end of my episodes. So today's special thanks, and I have a special tier uh, as well for a Patreon supporter. So thank you, Scott Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Giacomo Ride. Thank you, Andy Koning. Thank you, Jim Burns, Tom Kelly, Heath Bat, Ben. Uh, I'm just going to skip that name for a second. Rick Calhoun of uh, Honey Picks, uh, David Ishizaka of the Timber Owls, uh, Jeffrey Walks, and Kyle Harris. And a special thank you to Ben Fair, who has uh, upped his contribution to $10 a month. Uh, I'm going to start calling him our executive producer now because um, I because I need a new perk. It's my first ten dollar supporter, so I I need to figure out what to do. That's special now. Thanks, Ben. No, really, thank you, Ben. <laughs> so, thank you, listeners. Hope you have a great time. Hope you had a great time listening. Hope you'll have a great time hopping over to Patreon and listening to the Patreon episode. But even if you don't, uh, until next time, uh, Barry, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate and everyone listening, and you know, everybody be good. Yeah, absolutely. And listening to me ramble about my Patreon supporters. So y'all, in the meantime, you know the drill. Be good to yourselves, be kind to each other, and try to make some noise.
This episode is brought to you by the supporters of 40 Watt Podcast over on Patreon. Go over to patreon.com slash 40 Watt Podcast, where for as little as $3 per month, you can help support the podcast and get every episode ad-free. For $5 a month, you'll get every episode ad-free, as well as a bonus episode every week. I can't overstate how thankful I am for the support of my patrons, and hope you'll consider joining the team and helping keep this show on the road. 